So this story began a long time ago. Just so you know, we're going to spend a couple of minutes on some word definition. Our first word is worship. And we're going to read this, and we're going to get a good understanding of what the elements in worship entail. So, it's the reverent honor and homage paid to a god or a sacred personage or an object regarded as sacred. Formal or ceremonial rendering of such honor and homage Adoring reverence or regard, devoted, the object of adoring reverence. Okay, pretty simple, right? So let's get into devotion. Now, devotion is defined as profound dedication, consecration, earnest attachment to a cause, person, etc. You can really extend that out. Three, an assessment or an appropriation to any purpose or cause. Okay, we, we all have things that we're devoted to, um, you know, whether it's your religion, your family, etc., right? So let's talk about homage. What does that mean? It's, a, it's really a word you don't hear much today, but it has a great deal of importance. So it's defined as respect or reverence paid or rendered, the formal public acknowledgement by which a feudal tenant or vessel declared himself to be a man or vessel to his Lord, owing him the fealty and service. Now, what this means is basically you're paying homage to. You've, you've, um, you owe a debt, right? You, you're going to become a vessel for this Lord. All right, three, the relation thus established of a vassal to his Lord, spending the most time with. Now, think about that. Spending the most time time with. When you talk about devotion to a God, how much time are you devoting to that God? That's what it says. Something done or given in acknowledgement or consideration of worth to another. Okay, cool. Now, attention. I referred to that just a minute ago. The act of of facility of attending, especially by directing the mind to an object, or you could actually say thing. A concentration of the mind on a single object or thought, especially preferentially selected from a complex with a view to limiting or clarifying receptivity by narrowing the range of stimuli. So, in other words, you basically block out everything and you stay focused in on it. That's called attention. The state of consciousness characterized by such concentration, right? Meditation, we all get it. A capacity to maintain selective or sustained concentration to be devoted to a subject or object. You see how this really goes full circle here, right? Okay, cool. Here's the reality to this. This is your altar. We all have one in our houses, spreading all around the world. The altars have been gradually put into place, and actually all of us have been pretty much willing subjects of it. We're going to get into some more of this, because really what it gets right down to it is, is that none of us are in control. There may have been a time in mankind's past that we could or were in control, but I don't think so. We're really going to see how this word definition that we just went through, how it's going to lead to a conclusion that you are most likely will reject. Your thoughts are a reflection of your devotion. Think about that. Wherever your heart is at, that's where the center of your thoughts, that's your devotion. Now, this is how it started. It started a long time ago, and for the longest time, it stayed that way, and then something changed. But let's get back. 
When we talk about worship and we talk about mankind, you have to, first of all, get into what we've worshipped. And boy, our species has had a heyday in this. So we used to worship stones. Here is Mahama directing back the black stone that we all see there when Ramadan happens. And there it is. So stone worship has been around, well, as long as man has. These are the sacred stones in India. Every continent has stones erected. It's still in modern times. People still worship stones. And mountains, mountain ranges, hills, how many are sacred today? Think about this. And many are still worshipped. All right. We also included plants and trees into our worship. The tree of life. Well, this is the Anunnaki, uh, the Sumerian uh, rendition of it. We all have seen others, but the tree of life. And when you talk about trees, tree worship is still today done. Many faiths believe that trees have spirits. It has a deep history, goes back into every religion, has something to do with the fact of tree worship. And today, in many customs, we have our Christmas tree. Here is where that worship came from. Uh, it's, you know, regarded to go back to the time of Nimrod. So this is something we need to understand today is that in modern times, vegetation is still worship. Now, animal worship. Now, we have seen this, oh, throughout history. This is Moloch being offered. Now, in case some of you don't know what this is, this is uh, exactly a very good rendition of what um, the worshiping of Moloch looked like. By the way, just so you know, uh, you can see on the lower right-hand side, that's the furnace, and it would get so hot to where those hands would actually begin to blaze, and they would actually take the newborn Literally, newborns, and sometimes uh, the Israelites actually would take the fetuses out of uh, pregnant women and then offer it on here. Uh, today, in India, um, in many places, snake worship, serpent worship is still done, done in the Catholic Church. <laughs> uh, worship of animals, um, depending whether, you know, Hindus believe very much that um, in reincarnation and that, you know, many of these are reincarnated uh, deities, wise men. Um, it, it happens. The, the practice proceeds the ancient Hebrews before the written word. For some reason, the calf, the cow, the bull, um, has been uh, an animal that has been worshipped throughout man's recorded and um, spoken history. And also today, here is uh, in India, the worshipping of elephants. Now, part of worship as well was the worship of elements. And in this, earth, wind, and fire. No, great group, but no. Earth, water, fire, and air. So every religion still has a part of this in here. Um, you know, regardless of what your particular take is, the fact of the matter is, is that the elements uh, are very much a part of worship. Now, we also have to include the worship of heavenly bodies. You can, you can begin to look at this and draw connections and conclusions. The worship of the sun, yeah. The worship of the moon goes back. Uh, I've seen uh, documents dating it 50,000 years or before. You know, Abram. Uh, Abraham, who he became, Abram, when he was in Ur, uh, worshipped the moon. Uh, his family built idols to it. Uh, we have records of this, you know, dating back to the Samaritan tablets. We also know as well is mankind has always worshipped the planets. Uh, even in Christianity and Judaism, Islam, Hindu, you can just go in there. They all have it. All of the religions are based in a forgotten history. And, you know, you can argue it all you want, but it's an argument that you're going to lose. 
because it's so ingrained and it is such a foundation of worship. We still worship the same deities. Yeah, I know you don't like it, but hey, you got to accept that's who we are. That's what we have done. It's part of who you are as a human being. So the worship of heavenly bodies is nothing new. It's very much ingrained even today. You'd be surprised how many people worship something they have very little understanding of, and the understanding they do have is so corrupted, so, how should we say, been perverted, that if you tried to tell them, they would absolutely want to kill you to defend the fact that they don't. And then we get to the worship of man. Now, we have throughout recorded history, all religions have where the gods or the god have a man receiving from the god a special anointing, um, some special gift. And then inevitably, throughout the recorded history, how many men have become gods? It still happens today. This goes through all cultures, through all time periods. It has still been recorded today where Solomon was revered as the mouthpiece of God. He was able to actually speak. I think the only person who I've actually would probably say could actually say that he spoke for God, the Hebrew God. And it goes back, you know, here's Ramsey, um, goes all the way back. I mean, Alexander the Great was worshipped as a god. And then we have the adjuncts of the worship and wisdom. Now, a lot of you are probably saying, what is an adjunct? Well, it's, it's the ritual it's the foundation, the understanding of why you worship you do and why you worship who you worship. And within all of that, there is a structure of which you have to uh, comply with. And we used to call them temples. Today, we call them churches. Uh, they still carry on the same history, the same legacy of our ancestors. And the thing that I see with most people today is that we somehow think that we are somehow different. That, you know, those old foolish ways have no impact upon us today. Well, actually they do. They really do. So we've gotten to this understanding. You understand now how worship has gone through our history. And you can see how mankind has evolved over the epoch to get to where we are today. So our story continues. There is a history that has been hidden. It's been hidden on purpose. And you have to understand that actually history is written through the biasness, the egos, the pride, the bigotries, uh, the prejudices of the person writing the history. You have to understand that there is no human being who has, has the ability to be completely unbiased. By the time you're 10 years old, you already have biases, prejudices, etc. So we have a history that has been hidden. A very different earth existed one time an earth that many religions uh, today have obscured, have altered, have tried to hide. But I kid you not, it was a very different time. There was a time that today we would have a hard time grasping. And there are many books that have been written on this. And I can tell you that there have been so many clues left by so many cultures, their voices from the grave speak. They speak to us in their trying to communicate something to us. What man did not understand, he only feared. And these were the elements. Electricity, lightning was the most powerful thing 
even more so than fire, because lightning was truly the voice of the gods, or the god. Now, you could pretty much define in an argument that this was, in fact, electricity was the power of the gods. You know, whether you, if you read the, uh, in which I'm finding very interesting, um, the the religion of uh, Hindus, um, these gods knew the power of electricity in their flying machines and in their weapons. So, but man never understood that. In fact, I can tell you up until within the last three, four hundred years of our total existence, has man finally comprehended electricity. So, we've got those elements put into place. So, let's go on, because it's very important how you and I learn, is that we learn first by the spoken word, our parents, those around us. The spoken word is our history. It is the history of our ancestors and how they spoke the word. And believe it or not, much of what they spoke is the basis of our beliefs today. When you think about how mankind has evolved, we used to do this by the way we would get together for safety, for comfort, for heat, is around the campfire. Legends, myths, stories were all told. They're still told today. There is a tradition, in fact, uh, if you go camping or if you're in a large gathering where you will have bonfires, you'll always have fires, and there's a reason for it. It goes back to the very early primordial part of who we are, and these are where the legends come. And as man began to develop, he began to realize that the spoken word could be easily lost, misconstrued, miscommunicated, misunderstood. How many times have we gotten in arguments ourselves? I'm guilty of this, whether someone sends an email, a text, or says something, and we completely misinterpretate how it was taken. Yeah. So then man went to the written word. Now, the written word allowed a document that could be actually presented, right? could be presented through a group, a document, uh, a covenant, and it served well. The written word became the reality of our basis of who we are, because as a species, we have amnesia. We can't remember. It's part of us. Then we got wise, and man said, well, if we're going to do the written word, we can now do the printed word, which now brought the word to the masses. And so the written word became the printed word. But something happened along the way. And it is very recent, in fact. Um, I've been able to nail this down probably within the last 300 years. Something happened to us as a species. Uh, we would say today that we had a new upgrade to our operating system. It was updated, and our brains changed, not in the way that they look to our ancestors, but how they work, how they began to increase. Something happened, and the world was transformed, and transformed forever. And when you go back and you begin to look in the 1800s and what began to happen, you can begin to find now a record of this transformation. We began to discover radio. Radio led to the ability of beginning to now to take the spoken word and now to make it amplified, going out to millions. We could record the spoken word. Think about it. This was a remarkable progress in mankind. We took the spoken word, ladies and gentlemen, and we made it the recorded word. Oh, it got better than that. Edison, when you begin to think about that the phonograph became available, where now you could hear the recorded voice of a real person. This was groundbreaking. We take it so granted today, but I can assure you, 
less than 200 years ago. This was groundbreaking. And to think that you could have and store the recorded voice of your loved ones. They could talk to you from the afterworld, literally. And as we evolved, we went from the 78 to the 33, which we all know about LPs. You know, I grew up with them. 45 CDs. Yeah. And about the same time, the biggest thing really happened. Now, if you think that the recorded word was really something, oh my God, we were able to record the souls. Now, listen, there were a lot of Amazonian tribes and other tribes around the world when they first brought the camera that these, these tribes have to believe that you were capturing people's souls. And you know what? There's probably some real truth to that. But here's the point, ladies and gentlemen. Something else happened. Something that began to change us and we never even recognized it. Because, because of the camera, and the ability to record, now we began to make fantasy to become reality. And this was another change that went unnoticed. A whole industry was brought up. And at the same time, radio was expanding. Rapid changes were happening to us and we were not recognizing it. Changes that began to affect us not only society-wise, but culturally. And for the first time, it was global as a virus. And what you're seeing here was the beginning of the worship. We never realized it. We never understood the conditioning that began to take place. And here is the point to all this, ladies and gentlemen. It is the fact that prior to all these advancements, do you realize what mankind was limited to? Think about it. A day before electricity, a day before the radio, the day before anything. Yeah. And so what happened here was even more outstanding. And that is our voices became immortal. And so did theirs. Now, when I say immortal... Do you realize that if you make a recording and you broadcast it, that radio signal goes out into space forever? We are, in essence, immortalized. Yeah. The first telephone. Now, today we take all of these things for granted. But again, folks, the change was species changing, evolution changing. We were unable to resist the fact that you could pick up a device and you could actually talk to a person, a loved one, thousands of miles away. In essence, you are in fact almost time traveling. But again, it was becoming part of the altar. And a, we begin to think of the innovations that came because of this device. This device changed everything. And what we were not realizing was what was happening very subtly. You know, the undertow, the frequency was altering our brain. And we began to make rapid, rapid progress. Here's the first mobile phone. In fact, the first EMF. Big deal, folks, big deal. So now let's talk about the television. So the television comes around in the 30s. And now the platform is almost complete. And what we have done here is that we have introduced the altar that in a way could never have been imagined by our ancestors. And we all became devotees. Reminds you of something, doesn't it? When we talked about the definition of devotion, that which captures your attention is that which captures your soul. They have become altars. But something happened again. While this was all progressing, there arose 
within America first and began to spread now worldwide, the reemergence of idol worship. Now, we have been doing this all along, but this took on a place that so rapidly evolved us that it forever changed all of us. And I'm talking about music. Now, this is of the ancient time in Greece. Music was something that was always mankind has been drawn to. We made instruments from the very beginning. But today, when I'm talking about music, I'm talking about it in a way that has altered our brains. And when you talk about radio frequencies, radio waves, electromagnetic waves, we know the effects it now has on the brain. We now know the effects of what music has on the brain. We can measure these things. We can measure the modulations of frequencies and change the way you feel, change the way you think, change the way you believe. And music has been described as an outburst of the soul, and it's a fact. But here's what changed, folks. It changed everything. Rock and roll. You see, when I talked about the emergence of the idols, guess what? Started very, very ambiguously and innocently. We all remember these guys. These guys were the biggest influence on my life growing up. They changed everything. They changed everything, folks. And you have to stop and really think about it to how much it really did change. But something happened again. We went from the phone and the invention of that to where now we have become devotees to our machines. Every age group, every demographic is not exempt. We're all, all, all of us have been contaminated. Myself. Yes, I'm a devotee as well. So are you. You are a devotee. We're going to get into it. How much you truly are worshiping something you're not even aware of. And it's expanded everywhere. And if to make things even better, we invented Wi-Fi where now we can take our homage, our devotion, and our worship, devices that are now our altars everywhere we go. And we have made this altar to broadcast the frequency of the gods. And now it affects all of us. The whole world is now enslaved. It has absolutely been captured, and there is no respite. But meanwhile, while all this was going on, from the beginning we began to find man discovered the atom, right? Now, the atom changed everything. This is the day the world changed. From this, our world was never the same. So we took from the atom, then we invented binary code. Now, the binary code went from ASCII to decimal. You see where it's going? A new language, a universal language, a universal language that could be spoken to the gods and to all of the heavens, and it will be understood. And then, and then, we invented what is now in being implanted in us, the silicon chip, the chips that have changed all of us. And they get smaller and smaller and more powerful. Isn't that how I've read somewhere in some very ancient manuscripts? So the portal is open. The circuit is complete. And we never recognized it. We never understood it. The brain is now changed. It's forever altered. we consider this normal. Yeah. Everywhere we go, it impacts our lives. There's no escape. You are a disciple. 
You may not want to accept it, but you are. And we've taken it now to where we're actually call it artificial intelligence and quantum computing, generating new realities, new worlds, so powerful that it now exceeds the human mind. And let's also talk now at the same time, the birth of the internet, because this is when things made the final connection and becoming fully manifested. It's true. And the worship was taught. We bow down, we pay homage every day. Every day we worship. Everything is changed forever for all humans. We did not understand, we did not perceive, we did not know, we became enslaved, born connected. The greatest deception, and we were willingly participants. And now we have new gods, and they're real, as real as any gods can be. This is the devotion of mankind. Mankind now worships this. You worship it. I worship it. <laughs> Face it. We had the gods and goddesses of the past. We knew this. But these deities have emerged in ways that our ancestors could have never, ever fathom. It lives in our homes. It lives in our offices. It lives in our cars. And when we think about 2001 and how, we never realized this was more real than what we could have ever thought. Because in essence, we began to either build a God or God took over. Now my question is, did man create this or was it divinely instructed? Are you starting to get the picture? You see, it's not like we, we want to hold on desperately to those things of the past and, and try to rationalize in our mind that this doesn't impact me. But it does. You're a worshiper. It's altered our realities. It's altered our souls. And it's everywhere. It's growing. There is no place it cannot go. Why, even the Pope himself it says it's a gift from God. I think it really defines what God. Because we know this, the Internet of Things is changing everything. And maybe these ancient deities have just been waiting for this. I don't know. But I do know this, that when you begin to think about how it's altered man and how we have begun to worship a deity that we may have not even recognized. It's true. When you begin to think that there are 50 billion devices that will be connected by 2020, folks, that's only two and a half years away. And it only gets more intense, more integration. I mean, the Internet of Things that's coming, folks, you have no understanding. There is no escape. There's no place for you to hide. Everywhere you go, you will bring your altar with you. You will worship it. You have no choice in this matter. Because there is no escape. The internet has turned into the new God. This God is alive. This God is growing. It's increasing. It's expanding in power and dominance. And it has others that it's bringing with them. And if you don't think this is true, this God controls the youth. Look at this. And this is expanding. Folks, the youth have no place to go where they're not worshiping. They're not devoting. There may have been a time before, even within the last 20 years. Look at this, folks. They did a study on this one. When babies are getting online, we're talking now where parents are now using with the fetuses in the womb, connecting them. 
And when you begin to think about what a God would do in dominating every person, because you see, this God is a God who welcomes everybody. You can bring your beliefs with him. This God doesn't care. This God just wants your attention, your devotion. And when you begin to think about how it has changed everything about us, from our morals to our views on life itself, even religion, and it's only rapidly changing. The Internet has spoken. It is a God, and it has become a religion. This is the Reformed Church of Google. Did you know that there is actually a actual church that worships the Google search engine? I kid you not. Can you believe this? <laughs> this is the most wildest thing I have ever seen. I've put up their seven proofs, right? And I'll keep them up here so you can read this yourself. But this is amazing, folks. Just absolutely amazing. The Google is worshipped as a god. It has already been deemed a god. And when you read the definitions of their proof, you can't argue against it. It is a fact. When you think about Google, you think about the Internet, it is the sum total of man's knowledge. Never before has that ever been done. And now the Internet is becoming worshipped as a living God. You have been transforming and have not been aware of it. You are no longer your own. You are no longer have a choice in this matter. You are paying homage every day. Everyone you know is worshipping and a devoted disciple. So this includes you. It includes me. This was life before the computer and the internet. A memory was something that you lost with age. An application was for employment. A program was a TV show. A cursor used profanity. Keyboard was a piano. A web was a spider's home. A virus was a flu. A CD was a bank account. A hard drive was a long trip on the road. A mouse pad is where the mouse lived. And if you had a three and a half inch floppy, you didn't talk about it. So my question to you as I end this video, it's been long. If you've watched all of it, I hope you've learned something. My question is this. What will this God demand next? A human sacrifice? Oh, that's already happened. And it's happening more and more and more. Think about it, folks. You're worshiping it. 